This is Audible. Recorded Books presents Breaking Stalin's Nose by Eugene Yelchin, narrated by Mark Turetsky and directed by Megan Berkman. Chapter 1 My dad is a hero and a communist, and, more than anything, I want to be like him. I can never be like Comrade Stalin, of course. He's our great leader and teacher. The voice on the radio says, Soviet people, follow our great leader and teacher, the beloved Stalin, forward and ever forward to communism. Stalin is our banner. Stalin is our future. Stalin is our happiness. Then a song comes on. A bright future is open to us. I know every word, and, singing along, I take out a pencil and paper and start writing. Dear Comrade Stalin, I want to thank you personally for my happy childhood. I am fortunate to live in the Soviet Union, the most democratic and progressive country in the world. I have read how hard the lives of children are in the capitalist countries, and I feel pity for all those who do not live in the USSR. They will never see their dreams come true. My greatest dream has always been to join the young Soviet pioneers, the most important step in becoming a real communist like my dad. By the time I was one year old, my dad had taught me the pioneer's greeting. He would say, Young pioneer, ready to fight for the cause of the Communist Party and Comrade Stalin? In response, I would raise my hand in the pioneer's salute. Of course, I couldn't reply always ready like the real pioneers do. I couldn't talk yet. But I'm old enough now, and my dream is becoming a reality. Tomorrow, at my school's pioneers rally, I will finally become a pioneer. It's not possible to be a true pioneer without training one's character in the Stalinist spirit. I solemnly promise to make myself strong from physical exercise, to forge my communist character, and always to be vigilant, because our capitalist enemies are never asleep. I will not rest until I am truly useful to my beloved Soviet land and to you personally, dear Comrade Stalin. Thank you for giving me such a wonderful opportunity. Forever yours, Sasha Zaychik, Moscow Elementary School, number 37. When I imagine Comrade Stalin reading my letter, I get so excited that I can't sit still. I rise up and march like a pioneer around the room, then head to the kitchen to wait for my dad. Chapter 2 it's dinner time, so the kitchen is crowded. Forty-eight hard-working, honest Soviet citizens share the kitchen and single small toilet in our communal apartment we call Komunalka for short. We live here as one large, happy family. We are all equal. We have no secrets. We know who gets up at what time, who eats what for dinner, and who said what in their rooms. The walls are thin. Some don't go up to the ceiling. We even have a room cleverly divided with shelves of books about Stalin that two families can share. Stalin says that sharing our living space teaches us to think as communist we instead of capitalist I. We agree. In the morning, we often sing patriotic songs together when we line up for the toilet. Chapter 3 Our neighbor, Marfa Ivanovna, gives me a treat, a carrot. I take the carrot to the kitchen window, climb a warm radiator, and look down into the courtyard to see if my dad is coming. Sometimes he doesn't come home till morning. That is because he works in the state security on Lubyanka Square. The state security is our secret police and their job is to unmask the disguised enemies infiltrating our borders. My dad is one of their best. Comrade Stalin personally pinned the Order of the Red Banner on his chest and called him an iron broom purging the vermin from our midst. 
I take small bites of the carrot to make it last. The carrot is delicious. When hunger gnaws inside my belly, I tell myself that a future pioneer has to repress cravings for such unimportant matters as food. Communism is just over the horizon. Soon there will be plenty of food for everyone. But still, it's good to have something tasty to eat now and then. I wonder what it's like in the capitalist countries. I wouldn't be surprised if children there had never even tasted a carrot. Chapter 4 Everyone in the kitchen stops talking when my dad comes in. They look like they are afraid, but I know they are just respectful. Dad swoops me off the radiator and carries me through the kitchen, nodding at everybody. His overcoat is coarse and smells of snow. One neighbor, Stukachov, follows us down the corridor, smiling and bobbing his head, asking how many spies my dad has exposed today. Not that my dad would tell him, it's a state secret. But he catches enemies every day, that I know. He told me if I see a suspicious character on the street, I should follow him and observe his activities. He might be a spy. It's wise to be suspicious. The enemies are everywhere. When we get to our room, Stukachov is still trailing after us. I wish he would leave us alone and go to his own room, even though I know how crammed it is in there with his wife, three little kids, and mother. My dad and I have a large room for the two of us. I'm so embarrassed we live in luxury that I don't look at Stukachov. But I know he's there, stretching his neck and looking into our room when my dad closes the door on him. Don't talk to him, says my dad. He'll use it. I nod in agreement, but I'm not sure what he means. Use what? I'll have to think about it later. Dad is pulling off his boots while I'm reading my letter to Stalin out loud. He smiles and tells me I wrote a good letter. He puts the letter into his briefcase and promises he'll deliver it. Then he says, Your principal, Sergei Ivanich, called me at work today. Why? We don't have spies or enemies at school. He looks at me sternly, and right away I know I lack in vigilance. Can you say this with absolute certainty? He asks. I can't think of anyone who could be a spy or an enemy at school, but I say, no, I can't. He nods and hands me something wrapped in brown paper. That's not why he called. Open it up. Scarlet bursts out as I unwrap the package. The scarf of a young pioneer. The triangle of simple red cloth that every pioneer must wear. But how beautiful it is, and how long I have wished for it. Tomorrow, when I become a pioneer, I will wear it for the first time. I spread the scarf on the table, smooth the wrinkles, and say, The three tips of the pioneer scarf symbolize the union of three generations, mature communists, the communist youth, and the young pioneers. Tell me why it's red, says my dad. The red color of the pioneer's scarf is the color of our communist banner and represents blood spilled for the cause of the communist party. My dad nods and ties it around my neck, just as the rule says, the right tip extending lower than the left, and says, Young pioneer, ready to fight for the cause of the communist party and comrade Stalin? I shoot my arm up in the pioneer's salute and reply, always ready. Here, his face changes, and by the look he has now, I know what he's going to say. Your mother would be so proud, he says. I see myself reflected in his glasses, scarlet burns at my throat. My hand goes up to it. After tomorrow, I'll never take this scarf off, just to wash and iron it every night. I'm going to tie your scarf tomorrow at the Pioneers' Rally, 
not just yours. Your principal asked me to be a guest of honor, he says. I don't want to be disappointed, so I say, You can't come, right? Too busy catching spies? He smiles. I'll be there. Word of a communist. I leap up and hug him, and he hugs me back. He's so strong, my ribs are about to crack. Then he says quietly in my ear, Anything ever happens to me, go to Aunt Larissa. She'll put you up. Just then, our neighbor Orlov starts singing and playing his accordion. Be calm, our leader. We're standing guard. We won't give the enemy even a yard. Wherever we go, the world's set anew. Life's getting better, and happier, too. Dad sets me down, knocks on the wall, and says, Keep it down, comrade. It's no time for parties. Our loaf stops right away. That is how much everybody respects my dad. He turns to me and says, To bed, future pioneer. Tomorrow's a big day. Chapter 5 I wake up in the middle of the night, worried. Why did he say, anything ever happens to me, go to Aunt Larissa? I don't understand. What could happen to him? I watch the faint shades of the falling snow slide across the ceiling, listening to his even breathing. After a while, I feel better. Nothing could happen to my dad. Stalin needs him. I turn to the window, where a giant statue of Stalin gleams under searchlights. The statue is made from the steel of fighter planes and stands taller than any building. You can see it from every window in Moscow. Recently, my dad caught a gang of wreckers scheming to blow it up. Wreckers are enemies of the people and want to destroy our precious Soviet property. I can't imagine anybody who would dare to damage a monument to Comrade Stalin. But there are some bad characters out there. Obviously, they're always caught. I stare at the statue and pretend it is Comrade Stalin himself, watching over Moscow from his great height. His steady eyes track a legion of shiny black dots zipping up and down the snow-white streets. The dots grow larger and larger until they turn into shiny black automobiles made of black metal and bulletproof glass. These beautiful machines belong to our state security. I know because my dad has one. Night after night, Stalin's urgent orders drive these automobiles past our house. But tonight, one turns into our courtyard. I listen to the engine left running, doors slamming, and boots hurrying up the stairs. Then the doorbell rings. This is how we know who has visitors. We count the rings. One for the Shulmans, two for the Ivanovs, three for the Stukachovs, four for the Kozlovs, five for us, and so on, all the way to the Lodochkins, who get twelve. Ring, 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 ring. Five. They want us. Ring, 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 ring. Dad, Dad, a car for you. On Stalin's orders. Ring, 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 ring. He sits up, wrapped in the sheet like a ghost, glares at me wildly, and says, Stay in bed. I wait till he leaves, then go after him into the kitchen. What I see in the dull glow of the room is the white sheet, taut and sweaty over his back. The front door is open. He's leaning out, listening to someone on the other side. When he finally turns, he has a face I've never seen before. What's wrong, Dad? Out of the darkness... Three large figures in state security uniforms stomp into the kitchen. They follow my dad past where I'm standing and into the corridor toward our room. The last in line catches his cap against the laundry line, picks it up, swears, and clomps after the rest.
All this noise in the middle of the night, but our neighbor's doors stay shut. Nobody looks out to complain. When I get to the room, Dad is sitting on the floor, holding his ear. The officer's leather belt creaks as he turns to look at me, his eyes bloodshot. Nothing to worry about, little boy, he says in a hoarse voice. A friendly chat, that's all. The guards pull out the drawers and dump our things on the floor. They shake loose pages out of our books. They cut up Dad's mattress and feel inside it. They tap on the walls, listening for hidden places, and open part of the floor where the nails are loose. Soon what we have is in a pile, torn and wrecked. The only thing they don't touch is a framed picture of Stalin. But they look behind it. My dad is still pulling on a shirt when the guards yank him out of the room. I grab his arm and hang on to him as tight as I can. This close, I see his ear is bleeding. It's more important to join the pioneers than to have a father, he whispers hurriedly. You hear me? No talking, orders the officer in his scratchy voice. Move on, he shoves me aside. In the corridor stands our neighbor, Stukachov. It's me, Stukachov. I made the report, he says, smiling and bobbing his head at the passing uniforms. Comrade Stalin appreciates your vigilance, citizen, says the officer, and without looking at Stukachov, he pushes on, my dad's briefcase under his arm. Then all of us together, the officer, the guards, my dad, Stukachov, and me closing the rear, march down the corridor to the dimly lit kitchen. I notice we are walking in step. Left, right, left, right, left, right. Like on parade. Comrade Senior Lieutenant, calls Stukachov. Regarding the boy? The state will bring him up, says the officer. They'll collect him first thing in the morning. Wise, Stukachov says. We'll be moving in then? The officer doesn't answer. Stukachov halts, and I bump into him. And by the time I loop around and reach the front door, they are trotting down the steps. Dad! Dad, wait! The officer spins and slams the front door shut with such force I have to pull back fast so it won't smash my face. I try opening it, but the lock is jammed. I kick and kick but the door won't budge. I dart to the window. Down below, the guards shove my dad into the car and slam the door. The engine revs up, tires spin in the snow, and, when the car leaps forward, the headlights blast across the windows. The icy glass before me flares up, turning white. When it's clear again, the courtyard is empty. Chapter 6 Soon the courtyard turns blurry, warped at the edges. I rub my eyes and my knuckles come away wet. Then I hear a broom sweeping the floor somewhere. I turn and listen. It's coming from our room. When I get there, the door is open. Stukachov's wife is in our room, sweeping. What a good woman! Rising from her sleep, helping to clean up. Move it, Vasya, she says. They've changed their minds before. I look into the room, and Stukachov is there, too. He smiles at me briefly. He's piling our broken things on top of my dad's bedsheet, which is still stained with his sweat. Then he lifts the edges and ties the corners together. He takes the sack out and sets it in the corridor next to our other things, all broken. Then, as though I'm not there, they start moving their things into our room. Stukachov's mother comes in fast, carrying her pillow. It doesn't take them long to set up their furniture, make the beds, and bring their sleeping kids one by one and tuck them in. It all happens so quickly, I don't even know yet how I feel about sharing our room with them. I start to walk in, 
but Stukachov blocks the door. I reach for the door handle, but his hand is clutching it. He leans in close. Your daddy's been arrested, he says. There's no room for you here. I step back. He nods approvingly, steps into the room, and closes the door. He'll enjoy the orphanage, he says to his wife. All nice children. The lock clicks. Chapter 7 I've never been out alone in the middle of the night. A wind rattles the courtyard's gate as I peer into the dark street. Not a citizen in sight. I know there's nothing to be afraid of, and yet I don't go out there. I step back into the courtyard and look up at our dark window. The Stukachovs are sleeping, warm and cozy in our room. Tomorrow they'll throw away our broken things. That doesn't matter, of course. My dad and I oppose personal property on principle. Personal property will disappear when communism comes. But still. I need to think things over. I could go back and sleep on the floor in the kitchen, next to the stove. I bet it's still warm after all the day's cooking. It's a large iron stove with twelve rings, one ring per family. After my mom died, we put a little Primus stove into our room for warming things up and gave our ring on the stove to the Stukachovs. With so many dependents to feed, they needed it more. Maybe that's what my dad meant when he said, don't talk to Stukachov, he'll use it. First we gave him the stove ring, now he's taken our room. Maybe I don't need a room. Not everybody has one. Marfa Ivanovna doesn't have a room. She lives in a cubbyhole next to the toilet. Semyonov sleeps behind the curtain in the corridor. And nobody's complaining. I feel better already. I'm staying in the kitchen until my dad returns. Walking back to the door, I step over some tracks frozen into the snow. When I see these are the tire tracks from the car that took away my dad, I stop. Going back in that apartment is a weakness, not fit for a future pioneer. They clearly arrested my dad by mistake. Wait till Stalin finds out. But how long will it take before they tell Stalin? Stalin is busy. He has to take care of all of us, millions all over the country. And what if they don't tell him for a long time? Could be several days even. Who knows? My dad has to be at our Pioneers Rally tomorrow by noon. There's no time to waste. I will tell Stalin myself. Chapter 8 Red Square is deserted. Layers of cobblestones under thick black ice. To go faster, I slide, my boots skimming over reflections of ruby stars that glow atop the Kremlin Towers. The Kremlin is where Comrade Stalin's office is. Everybody knows his window. It's lit all night long. Our leader works hard. I imagine I'm there already, in Stalin's office. He is sitting behind his desk, smoking his pipe. No time to lose, Comrade Stalin, I say. My dad has been arrested. He raises his eyebrows. He grabs the telephone. Special unit? Emergency, he says. Rents Zaychik's dad from the traitor's claws. But when the Kremlin guards see me, they run across the square, shouting and tugging at their sidearms. One slides on the ice and bumps into me. He swears, steam bursts out of his mouth, and he plunges his enormous mitten into my face. I duck under and run. The guard blows a whistle, and other whistles join in. Suddenly, guards are everywhere. One slips and falls, and his pistol goes off like a whip crack. At the far end of the square, a black automobile turns the corner, headlights slashing me in half. Chapter 9 
I'm winded from running, so I take my time climbing the stairs. What was I thinking? That any fool could just walk into the Kremlin and talk to Stalin? With enemies everywhere and the international situation the way it is? Dad's right. I'm not serious enough. I don't think hard enough. Aunt Larissa's apartment is on the fifth floor. When I get to her door, I stare at the nameplates under the buzzer. The number nine is scribbled next to her husband's name. I reach for the buzzer, but don't touch it. I don't want her sitting up in bed, counting rings, wondering who has come for them in the middle of the night. I sit down on the step to catch my breath. The door flies open, and there's Aunt Larissa, holding a baby wrapped in a blanket. I knew it, she whispers. He's been arrested, right? Arrested? I stand up. The baby starts crying, and Aunt Larissa begins rocking it. Don't cry, baby. When you grow up, you'll be living in communism, I say, and reach in to tickle the baby. But Aunt Larissa pulls it away, frightened. Then her husband is there, leaning out of the door. What are you trying to do, kid? He says. Get us in trouble. I only need till morning, I say. As soon as Stalin finds out, my dad is coming back. Stalin, he says. He laughs, but it's a nasty laugh. It's not funny, I say. I will be joining the pioneers tomorrow, and my dad is... Forget about your dad, kid. Your dad's an enemy of the people, don't you get it? They don't allow kids of enemies to join the pioneers. My aunt says something, but I can't hear it because the baby is wailing. Shush, her husband hisses, and I'm not sure whom he's hissing at, my aunt or the baby, because both are crying now. He leans forward and drives his finger into my chest. Don't aggravate us, kid. Get lost. And he shuts the door. I'm almost at the first floor when I hear the door open upstairs. It's my aunt. I stop and wait for her to catch up. I knew she'd come, and she does, arms reaching out and pulling me in. With her face so close, I see she looks like my dad. Though my dad never cries, of course. He's wrong, I say. My dad's not an enemy of the people. You know that, don't you? She nods and pats my head, or tries to arrange my hair. I don't know which. I'm sorry, Sasha, she says. If we take you in, they'll arrest us too. We just had a baby. We have to stay alive. She pushes something into the palm of my hand, folds my fingers over it, and runs upstairs. I know it's money. I'll need it, so I'm grateful. When I look, it's not much, but at least in the morning I can take a streetcar to school. Chapter 10 In the basement of my aunt's building, I find a stack of old newspapers. I set aside pages with Stalin's picture on them, don't want to damage those, and make a bed under the warm pipes. It's not so bad in here. The basement is cozy. I think of the last time I saw Aunt Larissa. It was before she married that jerk. Dad dropped me off and said he would be taking Mom to the hospital because she was ill. I stayed in Aunt Larissa's room for two days. I didn't even go to school. When Dad came back, he said Mom had died at the hospital. I started crying, and Aunt Larissa hugged me and said to my dad, you look guilty, not sad. He didn't say anything, just took me home. There must have been a funeral. I wonder why he didn't take me. I need to ask him about that. The pipes gurgle and hiss above me. In one of the apartments, someone turns on a record player. Normally, I only listen to marching music, but this song I like. It's pretty and gentle. 
Why did Aunt Larissa say my dad looked guilty? He didn't. He looked sad. He blamed himself for not being able to save my mom. He's not even a doctor, but he's that responsible. I pull the newspapers over my head and start thinking about tomorrow. Tomorrow, everything will be better. Tomorrow, Stalin will rescue my dad. Tomorrow, I will be a pioneer. I drift off and dream of the pioneers' rally and see my dad, who's smiling and tying the pioneer's scarf around my neck. Chapter 11 The sound of someone scraping ice in the courtyard wakes me. A small window above my head glows bright with winter morning light. I dash up the stairs, through the front door, and out into the street. The sidewalks are crowded. Citizens rush to work, line up for food rations, push into the streetcars. On the corner, a loudspeaker blares our country's anthem. They always play it at 8.45 sharp, which means I am late for school. I chase after a streetcar white with frost, icicles hanging over the frozen windows. The streetcar is gaining speed, screeching over icy tracks. I manage to hop on, but the streetcar is so crammed with passengers I can't squeeze inside. I grab onto the railing and hang outside the doors. The streetcar bounces and darts forward, moving faster and faster, careening down the sloping street. Freezing air lashes my face as Moscow flies by in a whirlwind. After all the bad things that happened last night, this crazy ride is so exciting and fun that I start laughing. Chapter 12 By the time I get to school, it's snowing again. Everybody is out in the schoolyard flinging snowballs. I love snowball fights. I have three marksmanship awards from the war preparedness class, so everyone wants me on their team. I join in. Soon my team is on the offensive. But of course, Vovka Sobakin has to spoil it. Watch out, Americanets, he yells, and rams into me so hard we fly into a snowdrift. He calls me Amerikanyets on account of my mother. Vovka used to be my best friend, but I shouldn't have told him anyway. My dad warned me never to tell anyone. Stop pieing me, I say to Vovka, push him aside, and walk away. When I hear him yell, Death to the enemy of the people, I freeze. Does he know about my dad? I turn around just as Vovka is lifting a snowball, but he doesn't throw it at me. He throws it at Four Eyes. Several kids join Vovka and line up into a firing squad. They hurl snowballs at Four Eyes, who's backed against a wall. He doubles over and covers his face to protect his glasses. Four Eyes is Borka Finkelstein, the only Jewish kid in our class. His parents were arrested at the beginning of the year, and now he lives with his relatives. We call him Four Eyes because he wears eyeglasses. Anybody who's not a worker or a peasant and reads a lot, we call Four Eyes. And it's true, Finkelstein reads a lot. Hit him, Amerikanets! Vovka tries to force the snowball into my hand. The snowball is icy hard and would hurt. I don't feel like throwing it. Comrades, look! Vovka yells. Zaitchik refuses to shoot the enemy. Traitor! Someone shouts. Enemy of the people! Who's not with us is against us, Vovka says, grinning, and holds up the snowball. Everyone stares at me, waiting to see what I'll do. That's when Four Eyes decides to take a chance and throw a snowball. He's nearly blind, so it's a fluke but it hits me on the ear. Everyone laughs. Before I know what I'm doing, I grab the snowball from Vovka's hand and throw it at Four Eyes. 
there's a loud pop as it hits him in the face. The eyeglasses snap, glass splinters, and one shard cuts his cheek. Chapter 13 My desk is front and center, right next to the desk of Nina Petrovna, our classroom teacher. She always seats the best pupils up front. Vovka Sobakin used to sit in my place, but now he's in the back, in Kolima, with all the bad ones. We call the back row Kolima because Kolima is a faraway region in our country where Stalin sends those who don't deserve to live and work among the honest people. Vovka used to be our model student, first to finish tests, never a grade below an A, helping those lagging behind. Vovka had exceptional penmanship and was also a talented artist. When he won the art competition, our principal hung Vovka's drawing, Comrade Stalin at the helm, in the main hall. But one day, Vovka snapped. Nobody knows what happened, but he dropped to the bottom of the class academically and started getting reported for bad behavior. Vovka's drawing disappeared from the main hall. I have an important announcement, children, says Nina Petrovna. The communist hero, the eagle eyes of our beloved state security, and the father of your classmate, our dear comrade Zaychik, will be attending the Pioneers' Rally today, and will personally tie the scarves on all of our new pioneers. Isn't it wonderful? I feel everybody's eyes on me, so I sit up the way Nina Petrovna always tells us to, arms folded, back straight, looking up at her. I hope I don't look nervous. The rally is at noon, during the main recess. Will my dad be on time? I don't know. Did someone already tell Stalin? I'm sure someone did. Our state security is well organized. By now, Stalin must have sent his order. Free Zaychik immediately! It's such a simple thing. And Stalin is a brilliant genius of humanity. They always say it on the radio. You'll be joining today, Zaychik, says Nina Petrovna, smiling her nicest smile at me. Would you be so kind as to recite for us the laws of the young Soviet pioneers? Children, listen carefully and repeat after Zaychik. I stand up. I say, loud and clear, the young pioneer is devoted to Comrade Stalin, the Communist Party, and Communism. Just as everyone starts repeating, Nina Petrovna raises her hand for all to stop and says in a stern voice, Sabakin, what are you doing? Do not repeat after Zaychik. You know perfectly well you're not to be accepted. Vovka shrugs. Nina Petrovna smiles at me. Continues, Zaychik. A young pioneer is a reliable comrade and always acts according to conscience. Up, Sobakin, calls Nina Petrovna. How dare you repeat the sacred laws after Zaychik? Into the corner, criminal. That's the way our Nina Petrovna is. She's nice and fair, but when necessary, she's firm. In my opinion, she's the best teacher in our school. Vovka slides off his chair and hobbles to the wall, making crazy faces. Everyone laughs. Face the wall, Sobakin, says Nina Petrovna. She turns to me and smiles again, but I see she's angry. Her face is all purple. I'm sorry, Zaychik. I promise there'll be no more interruptions. Please continue. She's keeping her eye on Vovka, ready to correct him. But Vovka's quiet, so I keep going. I've had these laws down since I was six. When I get to, a young pioneer has a right to criticize shortcomings. The door opens and Four Eyes shuffles in. I should have had more self-control and stopped myself before I threw that snowball at him. Four Eyes' glasses are gone, 
and he holds a bloodied kerchief to his cheek. Everyone laughs. What a pleasant surprise, Finkelstein, says Nina Petrovna. A stellar example of another individual who will not be permitted to join the pioneers. Then she glares at Volfka and says, Sobakin's work, no doubt. I didn't do it. Don't expect me to believe you, snaps Nina Petrovna. Finkelstein, what happened to you? For I squints at her, and his body starts swaying a little. Stop rocking back and forth, Finkelstein. You're not in a synagogue. Everyone laughs. Speak, Finkelstein. He doesn't. Pay attention, children. We are learning a valuable lesson. In our country, even the children of enemies are allowed a choice. Cooperate or face the consequences. She looks at us significantly. Finkelstein refuses to cooperate with authority, which is me, the teacher. In capitalist countries, the teacher would decide whether to admit Finkelstein back into the classroom or send him to the principal to receive his punishment. But remember, children, the Soviet classroom is the most democratic in the world. You will decide his fate. You will vote. Those in favor of sending Finkelstein to the principal, raise your hands. All hands pop up. Nina Petrovna turns to me, and I see that she's surprised. Are you undecided, Zaychik, or against? He did it. He broke his glasses, says Vovka, into the wall. Not another word out of you, Sobakin, or you will be on your way to the principal as well. Our Zaychik is an example of dedication. He is the son of a hero. Nothing like you. She walks up to me, puts her hands on my shoulders, and looks me straight in the eye. I have submitted a request to select you as a banner-bearer at today's Pioneers Rally, Zaychik. Imagine how proud your father will be, seeing you carrying our red banner into the main hall. Then she makes a sad face and sighs. Of course, I may have to withdraw my request. We don't allow those who vote against the majority to handle the sacred banner. You're a smart boy, Zychik. You understand. Hands still raised, everyone stares at me. What will it be, Sasha? She says quietly. For or against? I raise my hand. Chapter 14 The storage room is in the basement. I knock on the door, but it doesn't open, so I knock again. Matvyevich, the janitor, is half deaf and I bet he's sleeping now. Some people are just ignorant. They slow down our march toward communism. I knock louder. I'll knock for as long as it takes. Nina Petrovna sent me here to get the banner, so I'm not leaving without it. Finally, Matvyevich opens the door a crack and looks out at me suspiciously. He never allows anybody into the storage room. I wonder what he's hiding in there. I hand him the teacher's request, and he stares at it, moving his lips. Who signed this? He says. Nina Petrovna. Uh, doesn't look it. Where's the stamp? What stamp? The chief's stamp. What else? Anybody can just show up here. The rules say no stamp, no drums, no bugles, and no banner. This is serious business. It's state property we're talking about. I'm changing my mind about Matvyevich. He's not all bad. He's vigilant. I take the request back from him and fly upstairs to the principal's office. I have to hurry. Nina Petrovna has already started practicing for the rally. The carrying of the banner is the most important part. Outside the principal's office sits Four Eyes, still waiting. 
The worst thing is... He smiles at me. Sorry about your glasses, I say. He shrugs. Why does Vovka call you Americanets? I shouldn't tell him. My mom was American. Don't tell anyone. He squints at me. And she was arrested and shot? What do you mean? Of course not. She came from America to help us build communism. He nods. They think all foreigners are spies. She wasn't a spy. She was a real communist. My mom and dad are real communists, too, Four Eyes says. They're in Lubyanka prison now. Enemies of the people. I look away. Lubyanka prison is on the bottom floor of the state security building. My dad's office sits above it. My aunt took me there last week, says Four Eyes. We stood in line for two days, but when we got to the door, they wouldn't let us see them. No visitation rights, they said. My aunt tells me they always say this when the prisoners have been shot already, but I know she's lying. They're alive, and I'm going to see them. He leans in, grabs my arm, and whispers fast. You can get inside. Your dad works there. All I need is somebody to distract the guards. What do you say, Zychik? I'd do it for you if your dad were locked up. I pull my arm away so fast he tumbles to the floor. When I try to help him, he pushes me away. He gets up on the bench, leans back, and squints at me, smiling. It's all right. I'll get in by myself. Four eyes is crazy. Chapter 15 Matvyeich squeezes the banner through the crack in the door and says, Keep it wrapped. I didn't know the banner would be this heavy, but the weight makes it even more important. I heave it onto my shoulder, climb two sets of stairs, and enter the main hall. The hall is deserted now. Everyone's in class. I know I shouldn't, but I untie the cord and turn the pole until the heavy cloth decked in gold fringe, unfurls. The banner is beautiful. Comrade Stalin's profile, embroidered in gold thread against the color of blood shed for the cause of the Communist Party, shines under the curved pioneer's motto, Always Ready. At the end of the hall, a plaster statue of Comrade Stalin is set between two windows. Not a full statue, just chest and head, no arms even. But it looks real. I feel like Stalin himself is looking at me. I lift up the banner and, swirling the pole so that the cloth whooshes above my head, march toward him. As I march, I imagine the parade on May Day, my favorite day of the year. I hear the crashing brass of a marching band, and I see crowds of people applauding and waving red flags and shouting, Long live Comrade Stalin! Under my feet, the ground rumbles as the mighty Red Army tanks roll onto Red Square, and up above, a formation of fighter planes, flying in a cloudless sky, shapes six giant letters, S-T-A. L-I-N. I wish my dad could see me now. He'd be so proud. Already a pioneer, I'm riding atop a parade float, all decked in crimson and gold. I hold the banner as high as I can, and I stare straight ahead. And what I see is our radiant communist future. I can't describe it, but I believe it's there. Believing is the most important part. If you really believe in something, it will come true. The float rolls by the marble mausoleum from where Stalin, our great leader and teacher, watches the parade with his generals. He waves at me, his eyes twinkling kindly. This is what we are fighting for, comrades. This young pioneer is our communist future. What is your name, son? 
My name is Sasha Zaychik, Comrade Stalin, I shout from my float. You awarded my dad the Order of the Red Banner and called him an iron broom purging the vermin from our midst. Ah, Zaychik, Stalin nods, smiling. I know him well, a hero and a devoted communist. A terrible mistake has been made, Comrade Stalin, I yell. My dad has been arrested. What comes next has never happened on any May Day before. The parade starts moving backward. Not just moving. People are running, trying to get away from Comrade Stalin's powerful voice thundering across Red Square. Spies! Traitors! Enemies of the people! Who made this mistake? Who's responsible? Arrest them! Arrest them all! The float vanishes from under my feet. I tumble into the crowd. A stampede of panicked citizens sweeps me away, and soon I lose sight of the mausoleum. I clutch the banner to my chest. But then, I don't know how, I'm not at Red Square anymore. I'm back in my school's main hall, running headlong into the statue of Stalin. The banner shoots out of my hands, and its pointy metal tip knocks Stalin's plaster nose clean off his face. Chapter 16 The plaster dust sparkles in the muted window light before landing on the floor around the nose. I look at the broken nose. I look at the banner spread nearby. Then I look up at Stalin, now without a nose. It doesn't take much to know what will happen next. First, I will never become a pioneer. Second, the principal will telephone the state security to report an act of terrorism in his school. Third, everybody will find out who did it. Next, the guards will arrive to arrest me. It won't be a mistake. Like with my dad, I should be arrested. Son of a hero and a communist? I have become an enemy of the people, a wrecker. I have damaged our precious Soviet property. No, more than that. I have defaced a sacred statue of Stalin. Not on purpose, of course. It was an accident. I lost hold of the banner. It could have happened to anyone. But who's going to believe me? Nobody saw how it happened. Just then, a shadow passes over the nose. The sound of footsteps. I turn around, but no one is there. At that moment, the school bell explodes. In a second, the classroom doors will burst open and kids will run out and see what I've done. I leap up. Grab the banner and sprint for the closest door, the boys' toilets. Chapter 17 The stalls don't have doors, but I still dash into the farthest one to stay out of view. I stand next to the toilet, making sure the banner isn't touching the wet floor. My heart's pounding. Everyone's already in the main hall, the laughing and shrieking and stomping so loud the floor trembles. Or is it my knees? This is the last recess before the rally in which I was to become a pioneer. I feel the pioneer's scarf my dad gave me folded neatly in my chest pocket, right over my heart. The scarf is the only thing I took from the apartment. I close my eyes and say in my head, Dear Comrade Stalin, I'm very sorry I broke your nose. You know how much I love you. You know how much I want to be a pioneer. Please make it so I can become one. Please, I'll be your best pioneer. I promise. Just as I say that, the noise outside stops. Someone giggles, then stifles the giggle. 
Someone runs up the stairs. The door bangs, and suddenly it is Nina Petrovna's voice. Step back, children, step back. Immediately return to your classrooms. The decision comes instantly. This is what I'm going to do. Follow Nina Petrovna's order. She sent me to get the banner. I got it. What happened on the way back, I can't change. I will answer for that when the time comes. For now, I'm taking the banner back into the classroom. I try to wrap the banner, but my hands are shaking. I keep at it, and in the end it wraps perfectly, tight and smooth, not a crease. I take a deep breath, heave the banner over my shoulder, and reach for the door when it bursts open. Vovka Sobakin, who else? He grabs the banner out of my hands and jabs it around like a rifle with a bayonet attached. It's a drill we learned in our war preparedness class. So immature, Sabakin, I say, trying to sound calm. Hand it back. He jabs me in the stomach, but I'm not letting him provoke me. The pioneer's rules are clear on this. No fights. Next, he starts jabbing at the walls. Sobakin, I'm warning you, this banner is state property. You'll damage it. He doesn't care. He drops the sacred pioneer's banner right down on the wet floor and looks at me with eyes so scary, I step back. Destruction or damage of state property shall be punishable by the supreme measure of social defense, proclaiming the guilty an enemy of the people and shooting by the firing squad, he says. Criminal Code of the Soviet Union, Article 58. What? Are you stupid or just pretending? You think you're not going to pay for this, he says. Forget about the pioneers, Americanets. I saw you. He pulls Stalin's plaster nose out of his pocket. Chapter 18 Children, what is our duty as future pioneers, says Nina Petrovna? It is to collectively expose those responsible for what happened to Comrade Stalin's statue. Then, and only then, will we be allowed to proceed with the pioneers' rally. Act in the Stalinist spirit, and you will earn the red pioneer's scarf tied around your neck. Everyone is quiet. Nina Petrovna scans the classroom. Now, take out your pencils, she says. On a new sheet of paper, write down the names of the pupils in our class whom you suspect might be responsible. When finished, sign and date your list in the upper right corner and pass it to the front. Nobody moves. Children? Why are we not writing? We're not sure, Nina Petrovna. It's Zina Krivko. She always speaks for everybody. How can you not be sure, Zina? Did you do it? No. Do you think your friend Tamara did it? Zina looks at her desk partner, Tamara. Tamara turns white. Zina turns back to Nina Petrovna and shakes her head. See, Zina? It's simple. You know who didn't do it, says Nina Petrovna. I'll make it easy for you. Write down the names of the pupils who you're sure didn't do it. Relieved, Zina lifts a pencil, bends over her workbook, covers it with her other hand so nobody can copy, and scribbles away. Good, Zina. Keep going, says Nina Petrovna, watching her for a moment. Just make sure you are right. You know what will happen if even one name on your list turns out to be unreliable? Zina shakes her head. She doesn't know. You yourself will be suspected, says Nina Petrovna. We'll know that Zina Krivko is covering for the enemies of the people. Zina pulls away from her workbook. 
The tip of her pencil starts tapping the paper. Tap, tap, tap. I see that her hand is shaking. Nina Petrovna looks at her, surprised. What's wrong, Zina? Why did you stop writing? Zina opens and closes her mouth several times before she can speak again. I'm not sure who's reliable, Nina Petrovna, she says quietly. That's it, Zina, says Nina Petrovna. The ones who you're not sure are reliable are the suspicious ones. Those are the names you want to write down. Understand? Nina Petrovna looks up at the class. Children, does everyone understand? I hear people shifting in their seats, and soon pencils start to scribble. I look over my shoulder at Vovka. He's grinning at me and pretending to sharpen his pencil with a knife. When I turn back, Nina Petrovna stands in front of my desk. Sasha, you're not writing? I wish I had some excuse. That I didn't have any paper, or that my pencil needed sharpening. But there's paper in front of me, pencil sharp as always. Sasha, she says, this time louder. Write at least one name, Sasha. Should be easy to guess, shouldn't it? She looks over my head, and now I see she is staring at Vovka. She stares long and hard, making sure we all know who she's looking at. Can you spell your own name, Sabakin? She says, write it down. I turn to look at Vovka. Everyone does. Vovka's desk scrapes the floor as he rises, clenching his fists. What is he going to do? Hit Nina Petrovna? By the look of him, he would. But nothing happens. The door opens, and Matvyevich pokes his head in. All classes to the cafeteria. Chief's orders. Chapter 19 A wave of anger and profound outrage engulfed the entire body of our school when we uncovered the unspeakably monstrous crime that took place in the main hall. Undeniably, a group of filthy and cowardly conspirators, spies, murderers, and provocateurs has infiltrated our school. These heinous degenerates, these traitors to the motherland, aim to undermine... The principal, Sergei Ivanich, stops hollering to clear his throat. Then he stands there a moment, holding on to the podium, wheezing. He starts again. Sergei Ivanich is a dedicated communist, and I'm always in agreement with his speeches. But this time, he's gone too far. I should know. I'm the only one who knows what really happened. Hold on, I'm not the only one. Volvka knows, too. I turn around and look at the back of the crowd. That's where he'd be. But he's not there. Matvyevich locked the cafeteria doors. Nobody's allowed to leave. So where is he? Vovka is up to something bad again, definitely. But the spies miscalculated. Our fearless, keen-eyed state security will spoil their plans, unmask the pack of terrorists, and catch them red-handed. Sergei Ivanich strikes the podium. Without mercy will sweep off the face of the earth this nest of treachery and filth. My classmate Anton shoves me in the back. Zaychik, your dad's here. I push myself up so I can see through the window that opens onto the street. Anton's right. A black state security automobile slides up to the entrance. It must be him. He gave me the word of a communist, and he's kept it. Thank you, Comrade Stalin. Thank you for helping my dad to keep his word. He's coming to the Pioneers' Rally, says Anton, giggling. Maybe he can catch the wreckers. I wait for the black doors to open, but when I see who steps out of the car, I turn away from the window fast. 
It's not my dad at all. It is the senior lieutenant who arrested my dad last night. Chapter 20 When the senior lieutenant and his guards enter the cafeteria, Sergei Ivanich yells, Spontaneous applause, everybody! He claps wildly until the teachers start clapping, then the rest of us join in, and we all clap for a long time. I wonder if this is what the newspapers mean when they say, a prolonged standing ovation. Does it count if we were already standing when they came in? Sergei Ivanich nods to Dubasov, our physical education teacher. Dubasov dives behind the curtain and instantly returns with a wooden crate overflowing with loose sheets of paper. We all know what those are. Every class had to write a list of suspects of who might have broken off Stalin's nose. Dubasov sets the crate before the senior lieutenant and salutes him like a soldier. Sergei Ivanich waves him off, and Dubasov darts out of the way, embarrassed. The lieutenant doesn't even look at the box. We are still applauding when he unbuckles his holster, pulls out his pistol, and points it at the ceiling. The cafeteria turns dead silent right away. He slips the pistol back into the holster. His eyes search the crowd, but his head doesn't move. I shift to where I think he won't see me, but I can't be sure. Those eyes look like they see through walls. Whoever chipped the nose off the statue will now raise his hand, he says quietly. But somehow, everyone can hear, even in the back. I know this is when I should come clean, raise my hand, and confess right here in front of everybody. Forget about becoming a pioneer, Sasha Zaychik. Raise your hand. Raise your hand now. I know this is what I should do, but I hesitate. And somebody else's hand pops up to the left of the stage. The crowd gasps and heaves back. And there stands Four Eyes Finkelstein, holding his hand up. The lieutenant frowns and nods to the guards. They cut through the crowd, lift Four Eyes under the arms, and carry him to the exit. When they pass by where I'm standing, the crazy kid winks at me. Chapter 21 we walk from the cafeteria in pairs, holding hands. Talking is not allowed. I take the time to think about Four Eyes. We all saw the guards shoving him into the car. They did it the same way, doubling him over and pushing him in, as they had done to my dad last night. Now, squeezed between the guards, Four Eyes is riding to Lubyanka prison, probably smiling his crazy smile at them. Why did he do it? Why did he take the blame for something he didn't do? I imagine the car stopping at Lubyanka's gates. The guard stepping up, looking inside. He studies Four Eyes, waves the gates open. Is Four Eyes scared? He must be scared, wondering what will happen inside. Nothing will happen, of course. He's just a kid. Kid or not, they'll probably search him for concealed weapons. They won't find anything. What can they find, a snowball? Then they'll take his clothes away and give him prisoner's pajamas. Prisoner's pajamas always have stripes on them. They will probably be too big for him. I doubt they have kid sizes in there. Then the guards will lock him in a prison cell. Will he be alone? Or will there be others in the cell? What if there are real criminals in there? What if they are enemies of the people? Spies and wreckers? What if my dad is in there too? No, that's impossible. They don't lock a hero in a cell. But Finkelstein's dad could be there. His mom is probably in the women's quarters. His dad could be sitting in that cell, all worried, when the door opens and his son walks in. That'd be something to see. 
I stop walking. People bump into me, and the ranks get confused. Keep in line, children, keep in line, calls Nina Petrovna. Someone punches me in the back, and I fall in with everybody again. How stupid of me. I should have guessed it right away. Four Eyes took the blame so he would be taken to Lubyanka. What a clever guy. He figured out how to get inside. He did exactly what he wanted, and I helped him. Well, not directly. But it doesn't matter now. Imagine how happy he'll be to see his dad, and how happy his dad will be to see him. I wonder if they have prison cells for whole families. Tonight, they could be together, talking away. And who knows, maybe his parents are not enemies of the people after all. Maybe they were arrested by mistake, like my dad. Soon Stalin will let them all go. And if not, Four Eyes is clever. He'll think of something. Nina Petrovna holds the classroom door open, and we file in. She pats each passing head, counting. I smile at her. I can't help it. By the look on her face, I know the Pioneer's Rally is back on track. Soon I will see my dad. Soon I will become a pioneer. Soon everything will be good again. But just as I'm getting in, Vovka Sobakin jumps out from behind the door and slams me into the wall. Nice work, Americanets. His voice is so close, his spit is all over me. Let others take the blame. That's the pioneer spirit. Chapter 22 As the proverb goes, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, says Nina Petrovna, looking out at us from behind her desk. We should have known better than to permit Finkelstein to remain in our ranks after his parents were arrested. We have failed, class, slackened in our vigilance. But this will not happen again. Nina Petrovna rises, walks to where the group photograph of our class hangs on the wall, and blackens Four Eyes' face with her ink pen. That's what we always do to the pictures of enemies of the people, and it usually feels good. But not this time. Four Eyes is not an enemy. He just wanted to see his parents. <laughs>